we all know the story of Jonah and the whale. It's a very much talked about uh, story in the Bible. But we many times don't realize the second part of that story in Jonah. And it's about when he went to Nineveh. And we don't really understand the significance of it until you actually dive in and read the story itself. And realize what the whole point of Jonah's life was about. And what God was trying to convey to Jonah and what he's trying to convey to you and I through this story. Now, I'm not going to read about the story about the whale. We know about what happened with Jonah and the great fish or whale, whatever it was, that swallowed him and then spat him up. We know that part. But what I want to focus on is when Nineveh is being preached to by Jonah and they start to repent. I'm going to read Jonah chapter 3 and chapter 4. They're not very long chapters, but there's a point I want to make in these two chapters when we read them. And I'll be reading in the Amplified Version. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Go to Nineveh, the great city, and declare the message which I am going to tell you. So Jonah went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk about 60 miles in circumference. Then on the first day's walk, Jonah began to go through the city. And he called out and said, Forty days more remain, and then Nineveh will be overthrown. The people of Nineveh believed and trusted in God, and they proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth in a pendant mourning, from the greatest even to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh of Jonah's message from God. He rose from his throne and took off his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in the dust in repentance. He issued a proclamation, and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, no man, animal, herd, or flock is to taste anything. They are not to eat or drink water, but both man and animal must be covered with sackcloth, and everyone is to call on God earnestly and forcefully, that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may in turn in compassion and relent and withdraw his burning anger, judgment, so that we will not perish. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God had compassion and relented concerning the disaster which he had declared that he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. So at the end of chapter 3, basically the whole city of Nineveh repented. They turned away from their wicked acts. Great! This is amazing! This is wonderful news! But Jonah wasn't happy, because this was going to be the nation that would ultimately destroy his land and bring his people into captivity within 20 to 30 years. Within that time frame, they were going to rise up and finally destroy the northern ten tribes of Israel, and they were going to scatter them throughout all the earth. They were God's hammer, and Jonah wasn't happy that he had just preached repentance to a nation that was going to destroy him. Chapter 4 of Jonah. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still in my country? That is why I ran to Tarshish, because I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, and great in loving kindness. And when sinners turn to you, you revoke the sentence of disaster against them. Therefore now, O Lord, just take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah was not happy. They were turning away from their sins. They were repenting. They were having a revival throughout their land. And he wasn't happy. He wanted to die. 
Then the Lord said, Do you have a good reason to be angry? It's funny how Jonah didn't respond to God's question there at that moment. Then Jonah went out of the city and sat east of it. There he made himself a shelter and sat under its shade, so that he could see what was happening in the city. So the Lord God prepared a plant, and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to spare him from discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the protection of the plant. But God prepared a worm when the morning had dawned the next day, and it attacked the plant, and it withered. When the sun came up, God prepared a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head, so that he fainted, and he wished to die, and said, It is far better for me to die than to live. Jonah was miserable. Think about all the stuff that Jonah had went through, being swallowed up by a giant fish in its belly for three days and nights, being spat up, and then being called upon God again to go to that city, go to Nineveh, that city that's going to destroy your land one day, take your people captive and scatter them throughout all of the land. Go to them. Preach my gospel to them. Even though they're your enemies. What is it that Jesus says? Love your enemies. Do good to those who despitefully use you. It's hard for Christians to grasp a lot of times this. Especially when someone has done you wrong. Tremendous wrong. And you feel such an injustice that happens to you. And in many cases you would feel validated if something evil was to happen unto them. But God did say in his word to love your enemies. Preach my word to them. Preach my gospel. But why? Jonah was like, I know if they repent, they're going to destroy my land still. Even after they repent and after they turn to you, even when it comes to war, they will destroy us, Lord. They're my enemies. Then God said to Jonah, do you have a good reason to be angry about the loss of the plant. God asks Jonah another question. Finally, Jonah answers him. And he said, I have a very good reason to be angry. Angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 innocent persons who did not know the difference between their right hand and their left hand and are not yet accountable for sin as well as many blameless animals? And that's where the story ends. The whole point of this was I desire mercy upon everyone on earth. Everyone should have an opportunity and a chance to hear my gospel. And that's what God was telling to Jonah. Everyone has a chance. But Jonah knew that if the Nineveh took that chance, they would repent. But even after they repent, they are still going to war with my nation in a few years. They're still going to just scatter us throughout all the land. They're my enemies, Lord. They're still hated amongst my people. But God said, love your enemies. 
And it's so difficult to do that. I understand that very well. We all understand it. But doing it, loving your enemies, that's a whole nother level for many people. Actually showing compassion and doing good to those that mistreat you. Mm. God said, should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 people? That was 120,000 souls right there at stake that were destined for hell. God told Jonah to preach my word to them, save them. Jonah obeyed. He was still angry about it. In the word it says, be angry but do not sin. Jonah wanted to die. No matter what we go through, we are to treat our enemy like we would treat ourselves. And we may not want them to be remorseful or even repent of their sins. Because we know that God is gracious and compassionate. But what kind of person are you if, if they heed your words and repent, but you still have that hatred in your heart? What does that say about you? Does that mean you're going to heaven? Hatred is a sin. You're not going to heaven hating. They shall say to me, Lord, Lord, did we do all these great things in your name? Prophesied, preached the word. But if you do it to the least of them, you've done it unto me. Even if you don't think highly of someone, you need to remove that from your heart, from your mind, from every speck of your body. It has no place in you. But what does have place in you is the love of God. Without love, you are just a clanging symbol of brass. Without love, you and I are nothing. Hatred is foolish, but the love of God, now that's what's wise. God bless you, my brothers and sisters.